You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ross K. from Ross K. Realty Consultants. Welcome to the show, Ross. Thanks a lot, Jim. Thanks for having me back. The Canadian Real Estate Association has released their monthly numbers. Anything there that really catches your interest? Uh, it catches my interest. Well, it catches my interest is that they're not disclosing what they're measuring month to month, Jim. So, and, and this has been an ongoing problem now for a decade. They just fail to tell the consumer what's actually being measured in any given month. So if, if you look at an average, so what an average means is is that if there's a thousand houses that sold in Canada this month, they would put those houses together, divide by a thousand, what they all sold for, divide by a thousand, and they would have the average selling price. So last year, when Calgary was having a lot more sales than it did that it did this year or is having this year, Calgary had more of that 1,000 sales. Calgary had a whole bunch more homes included in that count. Now, this year, Calgary has fewer homes. But in Calgary's case, prices are also declining. So the impact of the deflation that's happening in Calgary is hidden simply because fewer homes are trading hands. So the way that it works for a national calculation on average also works on provincial calculations, regional calculations, and even calculations at your local uh, town level. To some degree, it even works in terms of just a specific neighborhood where the shift in sales hides the fact of what the real ongoing price change is. So what we see in Canada, you see in today's stat, uh, the Canadian Real Estate Association said if you remove the greater Vancouver and the greater Toronto area from their stats, that the actual price increase in Canada was 4.2% year over year. Well, I can tell you that is not a factual number. Um, it is uh, a causal effect of the number of sales that are being reported. So when you look at the fact Calgary, so why has Calgary's price only dropped 1% as, a, as it's uh, reported from that real estate board, their real estate board there in Calgary? Well, the reason that it's reported one per, only 1% drop is because their sales mix has shifted to newer homes. If you were to look in Calgary today, 40, over 40% of the homes for sale were built in the last 10 years. That means the number of sales that are taking place are taking place against properties of a higher quality than existed 10 years before. This is a common pattern that's followed through real estate over time, and this is why average selling price, all it does is it measures the overvaluation of the housing stock. So you remove the overvaluation cause, and you get the real price of real estate. So... Right now, I think uh, August, uh, the Canadian Real Estate Association was claiming that the average price is around 432000 nationally in Canada. Okay, well, first of all, that number on itself is not a valid number. They're talking about sales that took place within 30 days. You cannot have an average selling price over 30 days. Uh, it takes a far longer period of time than that to uh, to judge a real estate market. But let's use their 432000 number. If you If you remove the inflationary factor because of the shift in the sales mix, the real price of an average Canadian home is around $272,000. So over time, when a housing market starts to correct and the sales mix is spread equally across all homes, the sales price, the average sale price plunges. And on that plunge, everybody panics that causes it to plunge further. And as the sales mix remains constant during that period, you see falling house prices when referencing the average sale price. So what the average sale price, all it can do is it can warn of how big a housing bubble is forming once you remove the inflationary factor. Houses in general that are built in the last 10 years or houses of the highest quality meaning uh, they're houses that are recently built. They have nine-foot ceilings. Even though they're on substantially smaller lots, the features of the home are features that today's home homeowner, home buyer wants. Those houses generally trade about approximately four times 
more rapidly than houses that are older than 10 years. So your average sale price is constantly skewed. And because it's a cumulative effect, that's what allows the housing bubble to form because the only way you can measure a housing bubble is by the average selling price. Where the biggest concern is, is that the banks, CMHC, the government, they all look at the average sale price as a measure of price change in the country. They shouldn't be using that measure. They should be using an adjusted measure that removes all the inflationary factor. The problem with that scenario is, Jim, they would have to understand how real estate markets function. They would have to understand what I just told you about the, about the trading, different trading rates of different age groups of homes, then the different trading rates of the different categories of homes, and then the different trading rates of uh, areas as they expand from the central market. So you, your central, the central market in BC for the entire province of BC is downtown Vancouver, city of Vancouver. That is the central market for the entire province. Whether anybody wants to argue with it, with me or not, it's irrelevant. Downtown Vancouver is the number one center of real estate trading in the province of British Columbia. What happens is all of the equity from outside of Vancouver. So 200 miles away from Vancouver, houses are being sold, and those, and those people are moving a little bit closer to Vancouver. That one's being sold, they're moving a little bit closer to Vancouver. And as soon as they have enough money via enough home selling, those people buy downtown Vancouver, and they're buying detached homes. And that's why your house price inflation in downtown Vancouver is what it is. It's not being caused by foreign buyers. Yes, foreign buyers may buy a small percentage of the home, but it's it's under 5%. What it is, it's just a pass-through of equity from hundreds of miles away in the province of Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, towards Vancouver, the epicenter of real estate in Vancouver. The same thing happens in Ontario, where downtown Toronto is the epicenter of the real estate market in Ontario. You have people from hundreds of miles away preferring to move to Toronto. And it over time, that's where the equity flows. It flows from the suburbs right into the downtown core. This artificially inflates the prices, and this is why you get a house price bubble, because when it pops, the average selling price plummets to redistribute the sales proportionately across how the housing stock is actually formed. The problem, the bigger problem, which is something we've discussed uh, on your show uh, earlier this year, was how this impacts uh, property assessment. How does, it, how does it impact property assessment? Well, you've got your local family who's owned a home for 30 years, 40 years. It's of a quality of home that was built 40 years ago. In other words, the 40-something buyer, it's really not a home that they want to buy. They want to buy that house that was built in the last 10 years. They don't want the 7-foot, 10-inch uh, ceiling. They want, want the 9-foot, 4-inch ceiling. They will give up the big, beautiful lot because they want the house. They don't want to take care of the lawn. They'd rather have a smaller lawn as long as they get their big house. This is just where buyers always move. Your builders are always changing what type of houses they build to reflect what the buyers are telling them they want. How do they tell them that they want it? It sells really quick. It's simple. That's how a builder knows. I'm building something today. It sells out tomorrow. I'm going to build more of them. I'm going to build them as long as I can. So what happens, because we're using the average selling price as a component of the market value assessment used to establish property taxes, and anyone who believes otherwise only needs to research how the property uh, evaluation methodology takes place. You just need to sit down and read the fine print, and then you probably need someone who, who can understand what that fine print uh uh, results in from a functioning real estate market. But what it means to me is, is that the person in the 40-year-old house, his price or her price really has not gone up the way that it's measured by market value assessment. It's gone up for, far less than that. What's really gone up is that house that was built uh, 10 years ago. Now, uh, the thing I'm wondering about property assessments is, what if you live in a condo 
surrounded by single family homes. Are you getting an honest assessment on your property and are you overpaying property taxes? Well, it depends, Jim, if there's new condominiums being built up around you. That's really where the question comes into play here. Because you see, the price of all condominiums coincides with what the new condominiums are being built at. You're you're often going to hear uh, so-called housing experts or housing uh, analysis um, comment about how much per square foot condos are selling for. Okay, they're making that statement because they're using average selling price. That's irrelevant to a condominium that was built 30 years ago, but since so few of those properties come to market, when they do come to market, they're priced in a parallel to what the the new condominiums are selling. Now, they will be at at a discount, but that discount will always be a parallel discount to what the average selling price has increased over time. So if you have a... um, the easiest way to describe it is this. Um, if I was to uh, to go out your way and look at a subdivision, are subdivisions sold in phases by a builder? Okay, so will you drive down the street and will you see a subdivision that says, or condominiums, phase one open. And then you drive down two years later, it says phase two open. You drive down a year later, it says phase three open. You drive down a year later, it says phase four open. Now, it may be the fourth building that they've built, but it's built the exact same way the first building was built. Each time those new phases are released, the builders raise the selling price. And in markets where new homes are trading, those price increases go quite rapidly. But what's forgotten in the process is those people who bought phase one, when they put their house to market seven years later, when phase four is just being being sold, they are going to list their property at the exact same price that phase four is being built at because they're selling the exact same property the builder is. That causes natural inflation in house prices to happen. You have to remove that in order to understand what the real price change is in real estate. We'll have more with Ross K. right after the break. Unbelievable harmonies, spectacular performance, Bird Dog and the Vintage Electric Band, the ultimate tribute to the Everly Brothers and Simon and Garfunkel in Oliver, October 2nd, in Kelowna, October 3rd. Buy online and save at ontourtickets.com. More and more people are looking to the internet for intelligent, riveting, and thought-provoking interviews. To advertise on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com, call 604-699-8600, 604-699-8600. Welcome back. We're speaking with real estate consultant Ross K. Ross, why are the numbers that we're getting from the government and the Canadian Real Estate Association inaccurate? The problem the consumer is faced with is that everyone involved in the housing sector in Canada uses selling prices to dictate the price of the next property. Now, I'm not saying you should list your property for less than what your neighbor sold for. What I'm saying is is that the buyer who's being told, oh, this is a good house to buy, oh, that price is the same as what the neighbor sold for, so you know you're getting an okay price. That buyer should be told, this is the price that it's at, this is the market value of the property, but current market value includes 20, 30, 40% inflation since the last time the market corrected. If buyers were told that, you wouldn't see the ongoing uh, price inflation and you wouldn't see housing bubbles form. Imagine if CMHC had a logical way to loan money on on real estate. Before they would insure a mortgage, they would only insure it at its real value. They're not going to insure it on its current market value. They will only issue insurance on its real value. All of a sudden, no buyer, 5% down, is going to pay market value price because their 5% down isn't enough to cover the market value price. They have to come up with another 20% just to break even in terms of what the CMHC will insure them for. And even with 25% down, because it's only then back at the real price, CMHC is still going to charge them an insurance fee to protect the the people of Canada. So that's how important it is when we talk about 
average selling price. And that goes back to what you just asked me about your condominium and how could your, your taxes are going up, should they really have gone up that much? No, they shouldn't have. But with the current methodology, which we discussed this months ago here on, your, on, on an interview you did with me, the current methodology of property being evaluated for market value assessment is incorrect. It never should have been authorized. The government never should have completed it. They should have had an independent consultant come in and show them the flaws in the model because when a housing market corrects, you're going to see all sorts of fallout from this incorrect property market uh, uh, market value assessment model. You've got people in Vancouver, like like uh, imagine in BC today, there are people living there who have, who have never moved. They bought a house, they've lived there for 50 years. Their property taxes are going up simply because one of their neighbors tore down the house, built a mansion on it, and now the property, the, the government has decided we're going to relate that to average selling price. So even though your house is never sold, since the properties in the area have gone up 20%, we're going to say your house is worth 20% more. Guess what? The property taxes for those people goes up that 20%. It's not fair, and it's certainly not fair to um, any of your listeners who have been rational and prudent homeowners over their lifetime. It's not right for the government to treat people this way, and I understand that it's ignorance on the part of those who are formulating these these policies and uh, who, are, who are formulating the methodology to calculate these numbers, but it's still not right, Jim. They're wrong, so it's not right. And you can sit down with these people in a room for maybe an hour, and after you've had a discussion with them, meaning the politicians, those creating the methodologies, they understand you've just provided them with the information they need. If they don't ask for that information, people are going to continue to be hurt. Would it be more fair to do an assessment on the average value of the properties that have sold within your own building? Uh, it would be to a certain degree, but the average value of the properties in your building still move in tandem with the average selling price for your whole neighborhood. And that average selling price is always skewed by a changing sales mix. Uh, when I'm trying to relate it to people, I relate it this way. Uh, I'm from small town Ontario. So in a small town, there are 100 homes. They're all the exact same home. They're all worth $100,000. They've been there for 20 years. The town hasn't grown at all, but there's always been someone living in one of those houses. Someone dies, someone else moves, a young family takes over the house. There are 100 houses. Ten of them sell each year. They sell for $100,000. That means every house in that community has an average selling price, because they're all the same house, of $100,000. Now, a builder sees that this, this community has never been built up. He says, hey, there's some people in there who have owned those houses for 30 years. I'll bet you they don't even have a mortgage on those houses anymore. They're mortgage-free. You know what? I'm going to start a new subdivision just off the end there, that, that nice little park that's there, and I'm going to build $200,000 houses in it. Now, I know there's 100 people. I'm only going to build, build 10 houses because there's probably only 10 people who would want to have a $100,000 mortgage again. Remember, the average selling price in this community is $100,000. He goes and builds those 10 houses. Only two of them sell. Only two of them, but they sell for $200,000. That same year, well, let's do it this way. Only one of them sell. Only one of them sell. That same year, Nine houses of the old ones sell too. They sell for $100,000 that first year. His sells for $200,000. The average selling price jumps 10% in one year because it's the average selling price. Now, the next year, everyone in those houses that were $100,000 last year have told the prices have gone up 10%. So they now believe their home is worth $110,000. The bank believes those houses, the average selling price now is $110,000. House prices have gone up 10%. The bank will now loan money on a $110,000 valuation. Same thing happens the next year. One, one of those new $200,000 houses sell. Nine of the houses that were only $100,000 two years ago sell again. Compounding in, 
uh, inflation takes place. And now you're looking at another 10% increase. You've got to do the actual numbers. I'm just rounding this off to make it easy. So what you've seen is now every one of those 100 houses that was only worth $100,000 two years ago is now worth $120,000 because average selling prices have gone up 20%. This takes place while the new houses actually stayed at $200,000, which, which really doesn't take place either because those new houses go up the same 10 and 20%. So that $200,000 house going up 20% is now worth $240,000. And that's how much money the bank will lend them on it, and it's how much money CMHC will insure it for. Now, does that make logical sense to you, Jim? It, it really doesn't, but governments sometimes don't do things logically, do they? No, but does the math make common sense? Not really. Does the When I explain to you how the average selling price increases this way, is that an aha moment? It's a self-sustaining fantasy. Correct, Jim. You, you, your words, that was a perfect explanation. And for your listeners, I did not give you that word. It's a fantasy that housing prices are going up the way that they are. And this is, I don't know why the, cons the public doesn't know this. I honestly can't understand why. Um, I go back to my 78-year-old my dad. I call my dad out. We know why housing prices go up. It's because a new subdivision gets built. That raises the average selling price for the whole neighborhood. It, it's a trickle-down effect. Another new subdivision gets built of even more expensive homes, it's another trickle-down effect. And then another subdivision, and so on, and so on, and so on. That's how the average selling price gets inflated. It's why you can't use the average selling price except for what you're going to list a house for sale at. Any buyer who buys that house needs to be told, yes, this is the price you have to pay if you'd like to buy this house today. But Understand, if the housing market corrects, you could lose 30% of what you paid because that is the housing bubble that is built into these home prices. The easy solution is the banks should not be loaning money on market value. They should be loaning money on the real value of real estate. A simple review of the last 35 years of house prices in Canada shows you exactly that housing prices only ever rise with inflation. When they rise above inflation, that's when a housing bubble starts to form. The housing bubble is measured by the average selling price because the average selling price inflates artificially. But for some reason, nobody knows this. It boggles my mind that this most simple of principles is not understood. Right now, when uh, the Canadian Real Estate Association released their, their average selling price today, they didn't tell anybody that 11.89% of the sales included in the housing mix they counted this year did not even exist last year. They weren't even built. They weren't e even inhabited. They've sold for the very first time this year. 11.89%. Those houses are worth 45% more than what the houses were worth that were selling last August. That's how you get a 10% or an 8% or a 7% how average house price increase. I just can't understand why the consumer isn't being told this. When we sold houses to our client and they would say, okay, Ross, I'm paying uh, $200,000 for that house. What do you think it's worth, Ross? I would tell them exactly what it's worth. And it may have been worth $120,000. There was $80,000 of inflation because of the housing bubble inflating and the consequence of mortgages being lent out on market value. They would then make an informed decision whether or not they wanted to buy the house. Now, if they were trading from an existing home to, a, to another home, th there was not a big battle because their, their old home was probably would have been worth had a similar price correction. In other words, part of the part of the money they're getting out of it really didn't exist. It's it, it's uh, it's fault. We called it false equity. Um, you're getting money that only exists today. If the housing market corrects, that money's gone overnight. Um, so that's how I sold houses. That's how my family sold houses. And we sold thousands of houses that way. Now, maybe that's why our clients never lost any money. They always made plans. Maybe that's why our clients took 17-year amortization instead of 25- or 30-year amortization. 
Maybe that's why our clients bought houses um, based on what they could afford if the market corrected versus what they could afford based on what the market is today. I don't know. All I know is when we're talking about average selling prices and what I heard released again today and the fact that in that release, no one said 11.89% of the houses we counted last month weren't counted last year at the same time. And those houses were worth 44% more. Do simple math. Figure out what the impact those 11.89% houses at 44% more caused on the average selling price. When you do that calculation, it's 100%. 100% of the number when you, when you remove the, the impact of inflation. 100%. This is how housing bubbles form. So when you, when you hear everybody talking about housing bubbles and they don't understand how a, what a housing bubble really is or, or how it happened, that's why they can't explain it to you. That's why they make these forecasts that are absurd. Um, that's why they search for measures that have no relevance to the real estate market. Um, that's why the Europeans say our, our housing market is overpriced by 40% using, um, rent to uh, rent to selling price ratio. It's how the Canadian Real Estate Association or CMHC says demand for these type of houses is outstripping supply. That's just simply a lie. It's not the truth. It's simply outstripping the number of how people that want to move from those houses today. And a lot of people are afraid, so they're not moving. And clearly the people who are buying the houses are not being told, whoa, hold on. Do you understand that over 33% of the value of the average Canadian home is being caused by the current housing bubble. If you remove the inflationary factors that have taken place since 2003 forward, you, the average selling price has to be corrected by 33%. I don't think very many people would buy those homes. I, I, I just don't think so. Ross, thanks a lot for chatting with us. Thanks a lot, Jim. I guess has been Ross K from Ross K Realty Consultants. His website, rosskay.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. Our popular YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter at Talk Digital Net. Comments about the show can be sent to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Comments made on HowStreet.com Radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.